This game was about as disappointing as you can say, like... I don't know if there's enough words that can describe how disappointing the game was against the Bears. A winnable game the Lions managed to piss down the drain. Especially with how brutal the rest of the season is and how the Vikings and the Packers now have life. A game Detroit could not afford to lose, they find a way to lose. Pretty disappointing. But before we talk about what happened with this game, let's talk about everything else that happened in Detroit sports this week. Detroit basketball! So now, so now to the epic shit show that is the Detroit Pistons basketball. The Pistons, another week goes by, another week where the Pistons continue to add to their losing streak as it now goes to 19 straight fucking games. <sighs> Honestly, nothing to see with the Pistons, just tanks beyond the eye can see. If there's any consolation, the San Antonio Spurs are having a pretty equally embarrassing losing streak to a Victor Wembenyama. Which is all the proof that Victor Wembenyama would not have changed to help the Pistons move the needle in the slightest. Honestly, watch this be the year the Pistons win the draft lottery because this year just so happens that there isn't a generational talent headlining this year's NBA draft class as there really isn't a clear-cut number one choice this year. Yeah, that would be the luck for sure from the NBA. That might, This might be the year where the NBA actually gives the Pistons the first overall pick in a year where there isn't a clear-cut choice. That's just the luck. Now to the only Detroit team this week that had any shot of winning at all this week was the Red Wings as they won one game this week, and that was against the Sabres in a pretty game that started off with the Red Wings getting off to a dominant start. And then holding off a late comeback charge from the Sabres. You know, definitely a lot of questions now about the Red Wings' um, defense for sure. Especially since that's like the third or fourth game in a row, second game in a row where they nearly blew a giant double, nearly blew a big lead. But you know, hopefully with Patrick Kane coming in the lineup, that fixes the issues. As yeah, Thursday against the Sharks was the big game. The debut of Patrick Kane in a Red Wings uniform. And the Wings, it started off slow against the Sharks, but in the second period, the Wings really got their foot going. As the Wings jumped out to a 4-0 lead in the fourth second period, even scoring three goals in 40 seconds. So yeah, 4-0 lead late in the second period. All the momentum in the world for Detroit. Now the Wings just got to keep their foot on the gas, and they blew it completely. Giving up four goals in three minutes to let the Sharks tie the game at the end of the second period. Detroit, what in the fuck was that? That was completely fucking embarrassing. You had all the momentum in the world, and you completely blow it within the snap of fingers. So it's not just the Lions that are prone to choking big leads. The Red Wings seem to do it too. And the Wings go on and lose the game to the Sharks in overtime in a game the Wings should have easily won. Especially when they were up 4 nothing and had all the momentum in the world only to piss it away. And then Saturday, the game against the Sens. Well, that was just a disaster waiting to happen. Patrick Kane got the one goal for the Wings, and then that was really the only positive in this game. As the main highlight of this game was Dylan Larkin getting completely knocked out by Joseph. And then David Perron retaliating with a head with a stick to head. Well, don't get it wrong. David Perron had the right idea standing up for a teammate. But the way he went about it was so fucking terribly poor. Like, yeah, it was terrible discipline on his part. I agree with standing up with him. Good idea. But the way he went about it, it was so fucking poorly done. Like, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way, and Perron did the wrong way. And the worst part is, Perron's probably going to get more games than Joseph for the suspension when, they, when the both of them have to spin the NHL wheel of discipline. Because in that situation, they never get the instigator. They always get the retaliator. And honestly, that incident is bringing out the worst in both the Sense and the Red Wings fan base. More so the Sense fan base. And then the Sense fans just tired to defend their toxicity. It's being like, oh, but you see these Red Wing fans? Look at what they're saying. So what is the point, Sense fans? What, you're just proving that you're no fucking different than the toxic cesspool of the, Lions, or the Red Wings fan base? You're just proving you're no different than the fan base than them. 
Like, if you want to prove that the Red Wings are this toxic fan base that you claim they are, then fucking be the bigger people and prove it. Instead of swooping down to their level. Like, honestly, this incident, it's kind of like, it's kind of looking like the successor. Like, it gives me a lot of vibes to that Chris Draper incident with the Avalanche, with the Colorado Avalanche back in the 90s. When Claude Mio took that cheap shot at, at Chris Draper. And we all know how that ended. Yeah, it's safe to say, I think it's safe to say that a lot of Red Wings fans now hate the Sens more than any other team. Like, this, like this rivalry with the Sens... It's starting to become the Red Wings Avalanche rivalry in the 90s. Starting to get to that point. I mean, if I mean in the next game with the Wings and the Sens in January, if that game ends up going with an all-out brawl like the rematch, like the revenge game of, in 97 against the Avalanche did, then it's very possible that could happen. Time will tell there. But honestly, the Wings need to get some players that can stand up for themselves and the team. And some of these players that are fucking softer than baby shit. Like, at some point, the Wings, they gotta stand up for themselves. They can't, because if they keep letting this shit happen, until they do, this type of shit's going to keep happening to them until they grow some fucking balls and give them a tug and stand up for themselves. Even though it's baseball offseason, you know, we still got a little bit to talk about with the Tigers this week. As, yeah, this week was the winter meetings, which meant it was also the MLB draft lottery. Of course, last year, the Tigers had some good lottery luck. A Detroit team having good lottery luck in this day and age? Color me shocked. But after last year, the Tigers' clock would strike midnight as in the draft lottery. They would end up staying where they entered as they would leave with the 11th pick. Not the worst case scenario. At least they didn't lose any spots in the draft lottery order. You know, at least in two, so in two draft lotteries, the Wings plus minus in the old draft order is plus three. Hey, Red, hey Tigers, you're doing better in the lottery than the Pistons and Red Wings combined. Outside the Pistons winning in the 2021, of course. But what pains the Tigers more is that the team that entered 10th in the draft lottery, the Cleveland Guardians, went on and won the lottery. Despite having a 2% chance at winning the lottery. It's alright, I already know it's rigged. I mean, if it wasn't rigged, then why the fuck is it not aired on TV then? Especially the entire draft process itself. Like, if you got nothing to hide, air it on TV for everybody to see. Like, if you're not letting everybody see it, then they're, then they're definitely hiding something, that's for sure. But of course, for this Tigers rebuild, the Tigers are still confident that AJ Hinch is still the guy to get the Tigers over the hump as A.J. Hinch has signed a multi-year extension for the foreseeable future. I mean, not A.J. Hinch's fault that he kept getting shit teams from Alavilla. He just made the absolute most out of fucking chicken shit that he got from Alavilla. But hopefully with the new front office in charge, mate, hopefully they can get Alavilla some fucking talent to work with in the future. Good luck, Tigers. Listen, I've known we've blamed Aaron Glenn for damn near everything and used Aaron Glenn as a scapegoat the last few weeks because of how bad the defense has been in this game. But make no mistake about this game, this game is 100% on the offense. This offense was fucking terrible in the game. Yes, the defense started off pretty badly with the Bears getting that opening drive TD. But the Lions defense, for the most part, was able to buckle down the rest of the first half and really played to their own. But the off but the but the D offense was just so fucking terrible throughout this game, you know. Goff once again had another bad game, turned the ball over repeatedly. This is definitely an alarming concern now. The third time in the last four games that the Lions have turned the ball over at least three times. Like the Bears in the NFC North, they have now figured out the formula to beat the Lions. You get pressure to Goff in the offense and make that offensive line collapse, you stop that entire Lions offense because the Lions offense is really good when Goff has protection all the time to throw. But once that O-line collapses and you get pressure to Goff, the offense efficiency goes right down the shitter. Which is tough, very tough. I mean, it's very tough for J-Mo to get any fucking offensive production when Goff isn't getting enough time to throw that ball to him. You know, properly. 
just very frustrating for sure. You know what also doesn't help the Lions offense? The fact that nearly every single drive to open the second half the Lions have had, they have completely been absolute dog crap to start the second half. Nearly every drive except for one game which was against the Packers. Part of that falls on Ben Johnson. Honestly, I don't think Ben Johnson gets as much blame as Aaron Glenn. Yep, I mean for Aaron Glenn, you want to know what doesn't help the defense and Aaron Glenn in, this, in these type of games? The fact that the Lions turn the ball over so much and put the defense in worst possible positions to succeed. It also doesn't help that they make Justin fucking Fields of all QBs look fucking confident. If anything, this means that the Bears are going to keep Fields around for the next three to five years. And not much will change in Chicago. I mean, the one thing Chicago got going from is that even though they're winning, they're still getting the first overall pick right now anyway because the Panthers are just a complete fucking mess since the Bears still have Carolina's first round pick. Just, yeah, just a complete, utter fucking embarrassment in this game. Like, not much to say. Like, this game all but 100% proves that Jared Goff is not worthy of an extension with the way he's playing right now. I mean, I mean, if Goff was playing consistently like he was to start the year, then yeah, I would probably stay on a boat that he's worth an extension. But the last four weeks with how he's turned the ball over now seven times, with the, how the offense has turned the ball over ten times in the last four weeks, that's pretty bad. Like I'll tell you right now, you're not going to win many games in this league turning the ball over three, four times a game. Just just a completely bad game. Like, this game has just showed how much the Lions have regressed in the second half of the season. Like, offense has just looked completely bad. Ben Johnson's play calling is starting to get a bit more predictable, and he's getting more cute. Because this team cannot figure out that you should never play fuck around and find out. You never win, fuck around and find out. Part is also falls on Brad Holmes too for not getting any defensive line talent up the road so far. Because because it's because it's the Lions D line only consists of Aiden Hutchinson and Ellie McNeil, and that's about it. Everybody else is either mid or nowhere near as advertised. And the Lions refuse to go get a guy like Nadama and Sue because, oh, locker room coach, you got to keep locker room coach. I mean, if the culture is as good and character, we don't want any character issues in the locker room. I mean, if the culture is as good as you say it is, then any character issues Nadama and Sue possibly has should not be a problem and it should fix itself. Like, the Lions definitely need to get their shit together. It's four weeks to go. Especially with how tough the rest of the line schedule is, it's pretty brutal. The last four weeks, because the Broncos have been have been really getting hot as of late, and the Broncos are only a game behind the Kansas City Chiefs for the lead in the AFC West. So that's gonna be a big game for the Broncos and the Lions that, next week on Saturday night. The Lions got a lot of shit they need to clean up, and only four weeks left to do it. And the Packers are probably only going to be two games behind now, and the Packers have the easiest schedule the rest of the year. Because Green Bay should beat the Giants on Monday night, no problem. I mean, the Giants just are a complete fucking mess. The Packers should win that game. So, yeah, and Detroit's lucky number is still three. Like, Detroit needs to win three of their last four. They, hell, Detroit, Detroit needs to win three of their last four to have a chance at winning the division this year and getting a home playoff game. But the way Detroit is playing right now, Detroit might be what be a one and done playoff team. They may not even win a playoff game at this rate, unless they get their shit together and clean some shit up and learn how to fucking play it pro the game properly. Just pretty frustrating the last second months. I mean, yeah, nine and four is an improvement from where they were the last couple years, and they've really turned around. But as good as it is, there's always room for improvement. Especially with how the Lions have looked not as good as they were to start the year off. They've just completely regressed, not making any adjustments, and refusing to adapt and evolve. Like, that might just be the Lions' downfall this second half of the season. Just a pretty frustrating effort. You know, you know, just gotta move on, refocus, and fo get ready for Denver next week. On Saturday night against the Broncos at Ford Field on a primetime game. Just pretty frustrating. 
And it's also pretty crazy how in just a couple weeks, the fan base quickly went from praising Goff to now turning on him completely. Just pretty frustrating as a whole. And no kitty, go away. So yeah, just a pretty frustrating game. Especially against a division rival like the Bears. You know, now you gave that now you gave that fan base all the fire in the world. But hey, congrats to the Bears though. You know, they did win this game fair and square, no excuses. You know, they Bears earned this one fair and square. Just pretty frustrating. You know, the Lions are a lot fucking better than this shit. And they just can find every single way to shoot themselves in the foot and play down to their competition. Just pretty frustrating. But you know. On to Denver next week. You know, we'll try and rebound next week. But, but I'll tell you right now, if the Lions want to have any chance of going anywhere, Goff needs to step up. And for everyone saying that they should go to Hen and Hooker, just pump the brakes right there. Hooker hasn't even played a, pro a professional snap in this league yet. There's no guarantees that Hooker is going to be the franchise QB this going forward. Even though I do want to see what we got with him, though, you know, there's no guarantees, though. He could be a lot worse than Goff. You know, Lions could be very bad with uh, Hunt and Hooker. Like, some people need to realize that find a franchise QB isn't as easy as you think it is. You know, you actually have to draft talent. And you actually have to have the right people in, around him for him for a, for a franchise QB to succeed. Whether we have the right people for Hunt and Hooker or not is yet to be seen. But pump the brakes right there. Like, there's no reason there's no reason just yet to get the expectations up for him pretty high. You know, at least until we see what he can do out there. Alright? If we want if you if you want to prove that Hooker is the guy, wake me up when he plays a snap in this league. Once he can, once he proves himself in the league with a with a few snaps, then maybe we could start talking about him being the future of the franchise. But right now, pump the brakes on and hen on the hen and hooker hype. We cause we don't know what we got with him just yet. But yeah, just you know, just a pretty frustrating game. But yeah, at least right now, we, at least the one thing that pauses from this game is that it really just shows who the real fans are in this situation and all who who all the fake bandwagon bitches truly are. Anyway, on to Denver next week. I'm done. I'm out.